gather up the answer sheets and we'll introduce our presenter here. Well, as I said, we're very uh, grateful that uh, Mike Vera was able to uh, come and talk to us about something that uh, we take for granted and don't think about very much, except when we're woken up at 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, so uh, 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 Mike Vera is a uh, UAA School of Engineering alumni. Um, he uh, 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 works for Reed Middleton. He's been a structural engineer here for over 30 years and has worked as lead structural engineer on a number of buildings that most of you or many of you may be familiar with or have been in or maybe want to be in. Like, I personally have not been in the F-22 flight simulator at Elmendorf, and that sounds pretty cool. The State Crime Lab, um, the Denali and Isleson Visitors Centers, uh, and uh, the um, UAA A APU Consortium Lab, uh, Consortium Library, excuse me, with the outward leaning walls was a real challenge. Um, but with this, he won an award from the American Council of uh, Engineering Companies, Structural Award for the design of this. Um, his work involves a lot of collaboration and communication, and uh, we're all really appreciative to have structural debaters thinking about this. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm kind of a virgin at this. I've never presented it to a, a group like this. Uh, so the first question is, are, are there any architects out there? Let me hear a clap. There, there are. Good, because I like to make fun of them. <laughs> How about any en en engineers? Are there any engineers out here? Okay, any structural engineers here? All right, cool. Um, yes, yes, we all like to make fun of them. But they pay our bills, too. So let me... Uh, let me uh, fiddle with this, and I'll get the presentation going. Mm. All right. As you know, I'm here to talk about seismic design of uh, buildings. You know how, how structural engineers design the buildings with earthquakes in mind, and that's that's why you're all here. And I hear this is kind of a middling crowd, like three quarters full, but this is like 10 times more than I'm used to talking to, so <laughs> this will be kind of nice. All right, who the heck is this guy? I could have said who the heck is this guy, or who the heck is this guy? Um, but I was already introduced, um, so you know a little about me. Um, I do want to say that I was sitting on a flight to Nome and Julie Olson uh, beguiled me into coming to do this. So th thanks, Julie. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be finding you uh, later in the presentation. I got a surprise for you. All right, so a lot of this is probably review for some of you, you know, because you're all science nerds, right? You're, you're here to know about science. And uh, though I know a lot about Earthquakes. I'm, I'm not really an expert. I have to know a certain amount to design the buildings, right? But I'm going to do an overview of, of earthquakes and then how we apply uh, the structural engineering, you know, to to the earthquake uh, motions. And hopefully, you learn a little something. Um, so everyone knows uh, plate tectonics. You know, we're, we're on a crust that's floating over a molten core, etc. So things bump around. And uh, any time you get movement between the plates, that's, that causes vibrations. If you have big vibrations, that's what we call an earthquake. Uh, earthquakes always occur on uh, faults. Which a fault is basically just uh, an interface between two plates. Um, I think the real definition of a fault is uh, a crack where each side of the landmass can move. So if you have a crack, don't say that's a fault. That just might be a frost eve or something. Uh, you got to have some movement between the, the land masses. And uh, where you do have a vibration, or because sometimes the, the plates get stuck. They're trying. They're always trying to move, but pieces of them get stuck. 
and as they build up energy and release, that's the earthquake, and we call that a rupture. Uh, a couple definitions. The epicenter of an earthquake is the point on the surface of the earth, right above the where, where the rupture occurs, and the hypocenter is the name of the spot, you know, at depth. So when you're talking about, you know, something that occurs west of Cookman, like 69 miles down, that's the hypocenter. So a couple, a few different types of faults. Uh, slip strike, uh, an example would be the San Andreas Fault in California. We've got the north, at that location, the North American plate is trying to move, um, I think it's moving south, and the Pacific plate's moving north. So they're, you know, moving like that. And as they move like that, they stick, and then you get the, the, uh, the earthquakes. I think it's uh, two centimeters a year that the, uh, the plates are uh, moving apart from each other. Um, and you're going to find out the, the trivia answer. I think it's uh, the correct answer is Los Angeles will be adjacent to San Francisco. Uh, then you've got thrust faults, and that's where they kind of they're kind of hitting each other and going like that. And a good uh, good example of that would be up here is the um, the subduction zone, the, the illusion subduction zone where you know the 64 quake occurred those are those are the big ones those are uh, those are where huge plates are fighting and, and uh, energy gets released when they when they finally release uh, relieve the stress everyone hear me am I doing okay I've got a laser pointer too <laughs> all right uh, what I have here is a blurry picture uh, you know, preparing for this thing, I, I really didn't, I've never done this before, but I found uh, two things is that the Google is awesome, and uh, PowerPoint can just make anything look really pretty. I mean, look at that. It only took a couple days. Uh, but anyway, this, this, this is a great slide that I found that describes uh, subduction zone movement. And let's see if I can do this. Um, this is actually kind of this is interesting. This is kind of what happened in the '64 quake. Um, so this is the the Pacific plate is moving north. You know, trying to get under Mount McKinley. Now, what these are, um, but as over the years, as it it was moving, it kept pushing the land back and back and back and making it get higher. You know, because it's being compressed. And where where is it going to go? It's going to squish. It's going to move up. So over the years, you know, decades, that's what happens. And then you get a, a rupture down here somewhere, and all that built-up energy just springs back. So this this that's been pushed up, that might end up being lower, and this out here kind of might slide up, which is kind of what happened in the 64 quake, right? We had places like Portage, you know, sink, you know, several feet, whereas Middleton Island and out just in the uh, Prince, Prince William Sound, Rose, uh, just textbook subduction zone claim. <laughs> All right, so earthquakes generate waves, duh. Uh, there's two kinds, there's body waves and there's surface waves. Uh, the body waves are the, wave, the waves that are inside the earth and then when they hit the surface, they become surface waves. Uh, so the body waves, there's two types. There's the P waves, we call them primary waves. I think they're called pressure waves. Um, this is where I wanted to bring one of my, I have a, a few really tacky visual aids I brought today. Uh, the first I was gonna bring was the slinky, but everyone's probably done this in high school or junior high or where you've got the slinky and you push on it and it makes a, a compression wave that goes back and forth in line. So that's. Those are the P waves. Those are the, the first ones that come out of the rupture. Uh, they're incredibly fast. They go anywhere from like two to eight miles per second through the ground, depending on the density of the, the rock. Uh, and those are the first ones you feel. So in the middle of the night, if you feel a jolt, that, that's a P wave. And uh, there's more to follow. 
then there, there's also S waves, which we call secondary waves. They're also called shear waves. Uh, honestly, I don't really know what they do, except that they're wiggly, and they follow the, the P waves. I can't say I've ever found or felt one. So surface waves. So once these, once this energy gets to the surface, it translates and goes along the surface to, to where you are to enjoy it. Uh, so we've got two kinds. We've got Rayleigh waves and we have love waves. Um, nobody loves the love waves. I think they were named after someone. Uh, so the Rayleigh mo waves basically move up and down like, like swells on an ocean. You know, almost kind of sinusoidal. You'll feel yourself go forward, backward, you know, kind of in a, in a vertical circle. And then there's the love waves. The love waves are the side-to-side -side ones. Those are the ones that cause the damage. They've got a lot more energy in them because they're in the plane of the, the soil, or the, you know, the surface. And uh, that's where all the accelerations come from, and that's, that's, where, that's where we get our damage, from the love waves. Someone told me, if, I've got like 60 slides, and they said you're supposed to spend two or three minutes per slide. That's like three hours. <laughs> I'm, I'm just tearing through these. Uh, okay, so this is another really nice pencil drawing that some sixth grader probably did, and I stole it from the internet. But it really explains what's going on. Um, so boom, there's the rupture. And these little orange guys are the, the compression waves, the, the, you know, the, the P waves, the slinkies. And then the little green guys, again, I, I don't really understand what those are. You know, they're shear waves. Uh, they wiggle their way up. So as soon as, as, soon as they get up, they, they hit the surface, and then they, they travel along the surface to you, you know, in, in the form of the, the Rayleigh, the love waves, which we just call surface waves. So this is pretty good. Uh, what's interesting is, so the P waves, they, they're omnidirectional, and they hit you first because they, they just kind of, let's say we are right there, right, right at that fault there. Um, you know, they come and they hit you directly, whereas the surface waves, they go up and then over. And as soon as they get to the surface, they're slower. Surface waves are just naturally a lot slower. Um, has anyone ever heard an earthquake coming? You know, like the ones from the north, the Castle Mountain Fault earthquakes. You can always hear those coming because was there a truck in the neighborhood. Uh, but next time you ever feel just a jolt, this is kind of interesting. If you just feel a, a momentary jolt, that's the P wave. And the longer the distance between that first jolt and the, the next ones, that really kind of gives you a description of how long, how far away it is, right? Because the surface waves are, you know, trailing behind. So if you feel a jolt and then a big, you know, then, then the motion, it's, it's probably pretty close. Um, the Castle Mountain faults, they're, they're usually pretty quick between them. Um, you know, last month, last month, I don't know, did, let's hear a show of uh, clap if you slept through that earthquake. You guys are handy. I mean, it, <laughs> I, you know, it woke me up, and I felt the P wave. I live in South Anchorage, right on the bluff, and so we were the first ones hit. And, and I felt that P wave, and I went, you know, I felt which direction it came from. I went up, oh, and then, then the rest of the shaking started. Uh, luckily, it didn't last too long. Okay, so here's the, the P wave uh, diagram of the, the slinky showing the compression, and um, again, it's uh, Bill Nye, the science guy kind of stuff that we've all done. But I still wanted to bring my slinky, I couldn't find it. Um, and again, surface waves, um, the side-to-side -side ones, those are the love waves that cause the damage. And then the rolly up and down ones are the, the, the Rayleigh waves. All right, Richter scale. Uh, Richter scale is a point of contention with us because people always come up to me and ask the same question: What magnitude earthquake do you design for? You know, what 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 magnitude you know should that big building be? And we don't design for for magnitude. I'll, I'll get I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but the Richter scale measures the amplitude of the waves. 
That's a trivia question. Um, the amplitude of the waves. Uh, Woo! We got it! <laughs> yeah. so, and most people know this, the scale is logarithmic. So uh, an 8 is 10 times stronger than a 7, and it's 100 times stronger than a 6, 1,000 times stronger than a 5, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's, it is, it's measuring the, the, the wave height, which is like in electricity, electric, electricity, it's a measure of power, right? The, the, the higher the amplitude, the more power. So, um, interestingly, there's a conversion for energy, like the amount of energy released. Um, it's, I think I said about 30 times, it's like 31 or 33 times more per number. So an eight is 30 times, releases 30 times more energy than a seven, 900 times more energy than a six, 27,000 times more than a, than a five. So when you think of uh, the 7.1 we had versus a 9.2, you know, that's uh, you know, almost a thousand times more energy, that's it's pretty impressive. And why they do it logarithmically, I don't really know, but it seems to work. Uh, so another thing that people don't really realize is the Richter scale was kind of done away with in the 70s. We now use something called the moment magnitude scale. But Richter scale, everyone knows that. It's like calling a, a tissue paper a Kleenex. So they use like the Richter scale on the news, but it's really moment magnitude. And if you're ever really, it, it met, uses the seismograph readings, but in a different way. Um, and if you're ever curious, um, Richter scales, they'll say M sub L, and a moment magnitude is M sub W. That's kind of important if you're ever looking at something back in, you know, the 60s that had a, a, a magnitude of something, and then they'll put in parentheses like M W 6.8, because they will be slightly different numbers. So, just thought I'd uh, share some famous earthquakes, of course, the Good Friday earthquake that we had, that was a 9.2. Uh, Loma Prieta, that was the one in San Francisco. That was uh, a 7.1, and that happened during the World Series. Uh, so that's the same magnitude as the one we had up here, but it lasted about 20 seconds, uh, 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, it was a little shallower, so it had higher accelerations. It did more damage. Uh, That's a moment magnitude now. I think when I came up here in the 80s, it was an 8.6, and it's like a fish story. You know, 20 years, it's going to be a 10.9. <laughs> <point. laughs> <laughs> um, Northridge was uh, the one in LA back in 94. That one actually changed our, our seismic codes quite a bit. Uh, Nisqually, that's the one they had in Seattle back last decade. Um, and then the Denali Fault one, I, if any of you were here in 2002, I didn't know we were having an earthquake. That was a 7.9. That's the second biggest earthquake to hit um, North America I mean, since, well, the biggest since the 64 quake. You know, that one caused ripples and ponds in Louisiana, and it was just sort of like a, a byline in, in the national news. Um, but, you know, that, no, the Denali Fault is actually a slip strike fault. It, uh, so it moved like almost 30 feet. Uh, the pipeline actually goes over the Denali Fault, and the pipeline's designed for about a 30 foot uh, movement, and it, it worked perfectly. Uh, very cool. Inniskin, does anyone know what the Inniskin earthquake is? I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but that's the one we had last month. They gave it a name. It's the Instant Improvement 7.1. And then I found a list of uh, all the biggest quakes in the world since 1900. Uh, the one in Chile in 1960 is the biggest that we know of, 9.5. Uh, looking at this list, it makes you realize Alaska uh, gets a lot of, everything around the, um, you know, the Ring of Fire around the Pacific Ocean, so the Ch Chilean coast, Japan, Alaska, you know, we get all the earthquakes. And then Sumatra in the Indian Ocean, I just won't live in Sumatra, apparently. Uh, 
do, doing the research on this, I did find something interesting that back in 1700, uh, we estimate there was a 9.5 uh, in the Seattle, Oregon, Northern California area. If any of you ever heard of the Cascadian subduction zone? Yeah, that, they're, they're screwed. <laughs> so do you remember the graphic where I was showing how the, the Pacific Plate pushed on Alaska, you know, for a long time and then it rebounded? Well, it's been doing that to uh, Oregon and Washington for a few hundred years now. And they're thinking, you know, another 9.5. It's not if, but when. Because it's actually moved quite, quite, quite a bit. And they're recording that, they're monitoring it. But that will be exciting. Yeah. All right. So when we design buildings, we don't use magnitude. Magnitude is just a measure of power. It's a measure of energy. It doesn't tell you how close the earthquake was. I mean, a magnitude's a magnitude, whether you're 10 feet from it or 100 miles. It's always the same magnitude. But you know that you can't design for something like that. If you need to know if you're 10 feet from it or 100, 100 miles, right? So what we use are the accelerations. The, the, the ones that the love wave, I, I just can't say that story, the love waves. The, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna say the surface waves for now on, because I'm being recorded. Uh, so the surface waves, the, the, the accelerations, the back and forth, that, that put, puts force in our structures. Uh, it's a horizontal acceleration, we have a force, it's, it's, we have a mass that's being exerted and acceleration. F equals ma, Newton's second law. That's that's all I do. Oh, here's pictures of a couple of our codes: the 2012 International Building Code that tells us how to design buildings and, and how to keep them safe. And ASCE 7-10 minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. Has anybody ever heard of that? Really? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's, that's my Bible. Uh, that, show, that tells me by code how much I design floors for. Like if it's in a public assembly, I have to design for 100 PSF. A place like this would be 60 pounds per square foot, and things like that. Uh, it tells you how much uh, snow that you have to add you know, to a structure, you know, what the, the, the force from the wind, etc. And then, of course, uh, ice loads, uh, thermal loads soil loads, uh, all kinds of stuff, and then seismic. And that's, it's a pretty thick volume, and about two-thirds of it is seismic now. All right, we, we use something called spectral accelerations. I don't know why it's called spectral. I didn't look up spectral, but it's kind of fun to say spectral. Uh, it's just the accelerations that are anticipated in, in an area, and we've People smarter than me, or more interested in them than, than I am, of uh, you know, taking historical data and research and um, estimates and come up with wherever you are on the on the surface, what kind of accelerations you would expect, and, and it's relative to how close you are to a fault. Okay, so now we've got the distance thing tied in, and what the the maps do is they they predict a maximum expected acceleration for that area, for something called a maximum considered earthquake, which I thought was the next slide. But this is, this is a typical map. It kind of looks like a contour map, okay? And you can't read any of it, and it's not worth showing you, but like here's Anchorage, and it'll say one, 150 next to it, well, between 150 and 160. And that's, um, how, that's really relative to gravity uh, in percent, so. Uh, the worst the worst accelerations we can feel around Anchorage would be 1.5 times gravity, so 1.5 g's. So if you're a 200-pound uh, person, you would feel 300 pounds of force from the accelerations. Okay, that's worst case once every 10,000 years kind of an event. So the definition of a maximum considered earthquake is one that has a 2% chance of being exceeded in 50 years, statistics, 
Um, what that means is about once every 2,500 years, you get an event like that. Um, kind of like uh, rain events or flood, you know, you, they always talk about 50-year floods or 100-year floods when well, we have 2,500-year uh, earthquakes. Um, and then nobody designs for that level. It's just unreasonable because if you have a building that's going to be around for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, you don't want to design it for that 2,500-year return earthquake. We design for a 500-year return that has uh, corresponding smaller accelerations. Um, and that's what we call our design level earthquake uh, acceleration. All right, so the applied lateral forces, what we deal with is the, the spectral accelerations, uh, the soil properties, which I'll get into in a minute, and uh, the importance of the, the building. And we combine all these to come up with a basically a, uh, a force zip on the building. All right, so I already talked about the 500 year return acceleration and uh, the, the maps that I was showing show, you know, the closer you are to a fault, the higher the accelerations will be. Soil properties, are, are there any geotechnical engineers here? Good, because I make fun of them too. Um, <laughs> They don't know what they're doing. It's <laughs> well, they, they do, but they, they've actually said it's within a magnitude of 10 um, on, you know, what they're doing. Because, I mean, they, how, they're, they're, they're dialing things in more now. There's, you know, seismic accelerometers that you put on the ground to actually record how much uh, parts of town move, et cetera. Um, but, uh, so what we do is the accelerations are based on um, the bedrock, like how, how, how much the bedrock would move. And then from that, we take, into, we take factors for the soil. Like is it a deep soil, is it silt and clay, or is it gravel? Um, you combine those and then we adjust the acceleration by those factors. Uh, because if you have like a deep, silty layer, it slows down the acceleration, but it increases the amplitude. And so you get that, I don't know if many of you last month felt that rolling motion after the, the quake stopped. Um, you're, you're on some deep silt, so you're enjoying that ride. Um, but people up on the hillside, they're, they're up on, most of them are on bedrock, so that what the shaking wasn't that severe. Um, so the analogy is bedrock is like hard candy, gravel, it's kind of like if you're jiggling it, you know, hard candy doesn't jiggle, but a slice of cake will jiggle a little, and jello just knocks itself out. Um, I was hungry when I wrote that. <laughs> and then we have the importance factor that we add to accelerations. We have um, four, yeah, four types of buildings that we look at, and we call them risk categories. Uh, we used to call them occupancy categories. Um, so the more important a building is, the more, the higher a safety factor we, we put on them. Uh, so risk category one, that's like sheds, greenhouses, if they fall over, eh. Um, the importance used to be 0.87, I think, but now they've raised it up to 1.0. Uh, risk category two, that's 95% of all the buildings. Uh, you know, this, this building would be risk category two, um, places, you know, restaurants, your house. Um, most normal structures. Risk category three is when you get into places where you have large amounts of people, like schools, um, universities, uh, places where you have more than 300 people that can sit in one spot. This is getting close, actually. Um, so you, you want a little more safety factor on those. And then risk category four is what we've always called essential facilities, the ones that you want to have some kind of semblance of operation after the big one. Uh, fire stations, uh, police, hospitals, etc. And then, so a risk category two is an importance of 1.0, but something like a fire station, we use a 1.5 safety factor. So whatever force we uh, calculate, we multiply by 1.5 for, for a fire station. And then to resist those lateral forces, um, we use something called ductility, uh, which in turn 
is uh, something we call an R factor. Uh, we've, in the last 30, 40 years, we've developed something called the fuse theory. That's not really a real name, it's just what I call what, what we, we have a fuse in every building. And then overstrength, uh, where we make some parts of the building stronger than others to, to deliver the, the seismic load to the fuse. All right, ductility, visual aid time. I have spaghetti, a coat hanger, and rubber bands. Um, ductility is a material's ability to deform and then absorb energy after it's yielded. Um, oh, this is so. This is quinoa. It's actually pretty good. Uh, but I, it, yeah, I, I tried quinoa, whole wheat, and normal spaghetti, and they all had the same ductility, which was really fascinating to me. <laughs> describe something again out of high school uh, Hooke's law uh, uh, the uh, load is directly proportional to a stiffness factor times the deformation so behold the rubber band um, as as you uh, stretch it, it it deforms if you double the force it goes twice as, as long and then you get to a point where uh oh um, it's reached its elastic limit this is where the elastic limit is where it, it uh, can no longer hold its, go back to its normal shape. See, if I, if I stress it more, well, this one's going to break it. If this one's going to hurt because it's thick. Uh, but it, but some, some things actually deform more. Like the coat hanger. So a coat hanger is an excellent... Uh, example of ductility. Uh, if I press down on it, it goes right back. Okay, that's it's it deforms, and then if I pull a little too much, I just yielded it. See, it didn't go back to where it was. I've actually weakened this this feel. You know, kind of push it back, and no one will know the difference. But, um, so what this is is um, I'm trying to explain this. So it has a certain amount of elasticity before it yields, right? But then this is called going inelastic. It's permanently deforming. And look at all the, you know, a, a lot of movement. It absorbed a lot of energy. I really had to put a lot into it, but it's not, it didn't fail. It still works, you know, not as well as it used to. Uh, this is called ductility. Going back to the rubber band, rubber bands really don't have good ductility because you know once you get to that yield point, it uh, it, it it fails. So this has no inelastic ability. And to further that, can anyone see? Can everyone see this? Can you see that on the on the camera? Yeah, go on YouTube. Okay, so spaghetti actually is a little bit elastic, you know, even when it's hard. You know, when it's cooked, don't throw out the cooked thing because it's completely different. But it has an elasticity, and then we get, see, every time the middle goes. Um, so that failed, right? There, there's, not, there's no inelasticity to it, like the rubber band. Uh, it failed, it's gone. There's, you can never use this again to resist loads, okay? That concludes my visual aids. <laughs>
um, which is why we like to build with steel, especially up here. Uh, so what happens is we take this reduction factor, the R factor, say, okay, well, we've got this material, it's, gonna, it's going to absorb the load, it's going to deform, and while it's deforming, it's absorbing a lot more energy, so uh, we, we give an, a reduction factor, which is a tremendous amount. I mean, if we had to design for the actual accelerations for, for earthquakes, there would be no windows in any buildings, it would all just be, you know, walls with tons of nails in it, because it's, it's just outrageous. Uh, so yeah, we use ductility for our seismic, for seismic resistance. So yeah, the more energy that can be absorbed through deformation without failure, failure is when, it, when the spaghetti breaks, uh, the higher the reduction factor. So this is, this is kind of the fundamental theory behind how we design for earthquakes with this reduction factor, the, the ductility of the system. Uh, when you have systems that don't have ductility, like uh, stone uh, shacks that that uh, don't bend or don't absorb, don't deform, they fall, they collapse, and that's why you see in third world countries uh, places that build a stone, you get all the damage and, and the, uh, unfortunately, the death. So th this is an example of things I don't know if you've ever heard of or seen before, uh, but this is giving an example of R factors for different systems. Uh, I did the uh, engineering building at UAA. It's a special moment frame. It has an R of eight. It did move quite a bit in the 7.1. But that was that was supposed to. Um, then, as you get down to less less duct, sorry, less ductile detailing, uh, the R factors go down, um, and you've got our, our shear wall systems. Uh, and that's see, reinforced concrete, believe it or not, can be highly ductile because you put a lot of uh, rebar in it, the reinforcement bars, and they take the tension. The concrete takes the compression. The when when it goes into tension, the steel deforms, takes all the energy, and so they do. They actually do very well. And then you've got braced frames, which we can get into later. So, just just to put it in perspective, let's say you have a hundred thousand pounds of force from a seismic uh, event acting on a building, and it's a moment special moment frame building, so you have an R factor of eight. That means you can divide the, the seismic force by eight. So instead of 100,000 pounds, it's, you're only designing for 12,500 uh, that's going to uh, reach the base of the, of the building. And that's, that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, reduction. So basically, the fuse, the ductal system, is absorbing 87,500 pounds, if, if we did it right. <laughs> there's always one, yeah, every earthquake, there's a, if they did it right. Uh, so the fuse theory is basically you design a building to have that ductile fuse, the one that's going to absorb all that energy, and you have to figure out a way to, to deliver the energy to that system. Um, Again, a few more about the fuse. It's, you're going from elastic to inelastic. Uh, the, think of the coat fang hanger going to where it's permanently deformed. I mean, in an earthquake, when the fuse deforms, it's, it's destroyed. You have to replace it. But what it does is it prevents the building from collapsing. And that's really the most important part. Not keeping the building operational. Um, that's, that's a whole different level of, of design but we want to keep it from collapsing so people can get out safely because, you know, a design level earthquake once every 500 years, uh, you know, that's, that's, that just, those just don't come along very often. So we don't design, that's why we don't design for the operation. There's this whole other thing called performance-based design that some clients are going to now, you know, like level of service, if you want it uh, operational in like a month or, or maintain operation, um, working on some classified military uh, jobs that uh, are risk category five, it's top secret, they have to remain operational after earthquakes, so 
Uh, it's just a huge amount of force we're designing for. And again, the inelastic behavior is that range uh, between the yielding and the failure of, of the element. Um, like the coat hanger from where I, I, from the point where it was elastic to where, where it would have failed, which I, I'm not even strong enough to have failed that. It would have, you know, been the full height. And, uh, that's the inelastic range. Here's a boring graph that, that uh, kind of summarizes that. The straight part, that's, that's the elastic range. That's where the rubber band, you know, obeyed Hooke's law. And then, or even, even the hanger. And then, once you get past that and, and into permanent deformation, look at all that. It doesn't get a lot stronger, but you get a lot more uh, strain or deformation and something that's wiggling back and forth, it has that strength to, to absorb that. So this is, this is really important. And this is what we use. Okay, so overstrength. So we want to deliver this large force to the, the fuse and make sure that everything works right. So we design all the elements in the building that are delivering the seismic, you know, we call them drag struts, boundary elements, etc. The connections of those, we design them for two or three times more load than the fuse. So what that does is it forces the fuse, the fuse is designed for the seismic force, and then everything else is designed two or three times more. What that does is it forces it to the fuse so that the fuse goes inelastic so that it, it's the one that deforms. That's something you're not expecting over in some part of the building, but your, your lateral element. And then uh, for the seismic analysis, we actually have four methods. I will not go into detail. They're extremely boring. Uh, but the two we mostly use are the equivalent lateral force uh, method, which is kind of like the first push on, on something, um, and then dynamic analysis, where it takes into account the, uh, the mass and the stiffness, the natural period of a structure, and how it responds to the vibration that you're exciting it with. Uh, we do most big buildings using dynamic analysis. So, uh, basic seismic formula, again, Newton's second law, F equals MA, uh, earthquake, force is the weight of the structure times an acceleration coefficient that we developed for what I just described, where that coefficient is, SDS is actually the spectral acceleration divided by the R factor divided by the importance factor. This is, this is the most complicated equation I'm showing today, so <laughs> this is it. So that CS is basically acceleration, so F equals MA, that's all there is to it. It's, yeah. Piece of cake. So dynamic analysis uh, is also called modal analysis, uh, or mass mode, mass modal analysis. And uh, oh, I get to bring up the gizmo. Okay. So the the natural period of any structure, any element, any any person is their mass divided by some kind of rigidity, a stiffness coefficient. You, you divide this, the square root of the mass over that stiffness constant, you get a natural period. So, here I have three buildings of different heights, but they all have the same mass. Uh, but their stiffnesses are all a little different, right? Because this guy is taller and skinnier. So, Boing, 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 boing. So that period is pretty slow, but the same mass, boing, 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 boing. Um, you have to do the boing, boing, boing. <laughs> and then boing, 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 boing. <laughs> okay, we, we made this about 15 years ago at UAA, and it used to be much taller, but the boing, boinging, some, sometimes people get too exuberant and we'd have to cut them. So this guy used to be about that tall. So over the 15 years, it's gone to bum, bum, bum. Um, But anyway, this, this, this is a good depiction of natural period. Um, so now what I want to show is, um, if you have an earthquake, how buildings with the same mass um, 
get affected by by the earthquakes differently. So I need someone to come help me, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Backs up, bitch. <laughs> All right, I need you to stand over here and hold it. There, there aren't. It actually takes a little bit used to. It's like we're doing a hula hoop. So, Julie's going to represent an earthquake. And what I want you to do is you can either tilt it back and forth or move it back and forth. Start out real slow, and what you want to do is move, move it at about that frequency to get that one going. There you go. And just, you know. Okay, see what she's doing? So there's an earthquake hitting that tall building at the same frequency as that building, and it's just going to town. And these other guys, you know, he's like, hey, what's up? And this guy is like, well, I'm a little excited, but I don't care. Uh, so now the earthquake, you, you get one that's faster, like you're up on bedrock or something where it's less amplified, and, and you, try, you get the middle one going. This is where it takes a little... There she goes. So keep, keep, keep doing it. Okay, but see now the, the, the tall one is hardly affected by that vibration. Uh, the middle one, it's, it's resonating with, with it. Uh, again, this guy's like, hey, whatever. Um, and now the, uh, the challenge is to get the third one going. You really got to just go to town on it. It was worth a try. Okay. That hand for Julie. <laughs> so a dynamic analysis, natural frequency is, is an important part of the design of the building. Um, if you get a building that matches the natural frequency of the earthquake, like you saw, bad things happen. Uh, 1985 Mexico City earthquake, um, all the the Mexico City's on a lake bed, and the way it amplified the vibrations, um, earthquake vibrations are usually about one to three hertz, um, one to three cycles per second, uh, maybe 10 cycles per second. They're pretty fast. Um, they hit the lake bed, and it went to a one second period. Uh, 10 story buildings have a natural frequency of about one second. So all the 10 story buildings, the mid rise buildings there were just, Destroyed, you know, they fell over, they're they demolished, and and then you know the 50-story and the one-story ones, nothing. So it makes a big difference. So we use several types of lateral systems, uh, braced frames. Uh, we make those out of steel. Uh, moment, a moment. Does anyone know what a moment frame is? It takes a moment to describe. <laughs> it takes a moment to describe. Um, I always, we always say moment frames, and even when I'm talking to clients or, or electrical engineers, I'm like, what's a moment frame? Those are the stiff portal frames. They're very, we also call them rigid frames. And just the stiffness of the connections and the heavy members um, make, you know, resist the, the elements, as opposed to a braced frame that has the diagonals, you know, like X braces and stuff. And that's, so those are taking it axially through the, the braces. And in the moment frame, it's flexure is what's resisting it. So moment frames, uh, because they move a lot, you know, through the flexure, um, they have a little more ductility, they absorb more energy, which is why they're a, a good lateral system to use. Oops, too far. Uh, sh shear walls, that's what you have in your houses. Um, though a lot of fancy houses kind of are missing shear walls because they'd rather they take them out and put in windows. Um, which is scary sometimes. <laughs> uh, but this, this is a shear wall building. Uh, you've got shear walls between the windows. Uh, it's a good system, especially wood shear walls, highly ductile. Wood shear walls are highly ductile. A lot of deformation because wood's naturally flexible. You get nails, the nails slip, you know, the nails can yield and stuff. Uh, you don't see a lot of wood buildings that, uh, that fail. And then cantilevered columns. Um, don't, don't, don't let a structural engineer let you use cantilevered columns. Uh, again, because the ductility thing, or the, the fuse, the cantilevered column, the, co the column is what's supporting your structure, right? And if that deforms, well, the whole structure falls over, so that's the point. All right, so here's, here's some 
pretty pictures of braced frames. Uh, you know, the first one, you got the X braces, the, I like the point. We call these inverted Vs because they look like upside down Vs, or very technical. Uh, single braces. Uh, this is called an eccentrically braced frame. These are, they're, they're a pain in the ass to design, but they, uh, they work very well in, in earthquakes. Um, Health Sciences Building on the campus, UAA, it's a eccentrically braced frame. And the fuse is that little thing right in there. Those, those deform and everything else stays elastic. And in fact, it's called the, the link beam, the fuse beam. Uh, those work great. There's a three-dimensional braced frame, which I liked, so I, I downloaded that. Uh, here's one where I think I got had too much sugar. And, uh, I mean, it looks like Texas or something, and everything's just braced, and I don't know what that's for. Uh, unless they're trying to make some kind of hybrid, rigid frame out of all those braces, which actually would be cool. Uh, but yeah, that's a, an example of a braced frame to the max. And then moment frames, you know, we don't have the diagonals in there, it's just the, the connections between the, the beams and the columns. Uh, I've actually had to explain this to other engineers. This is a column. Horizontal is a, horizontal is a beam. And architects, architects just call everything beams, and I don't understand what they're talking about. Um, here's a good example of a good moment frame. See, it's big and beefy and sturdy, and it's got big old connections and, and at the knees. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. That's, that's in fact, it's a strong frame. Uh, I actually put one of these in in a cabin down um, across from Homer uh, over by <laughs> Seldovia. So we can hide these in um, wood walls. So like if you've got a big window system or something and, and you don't want it braces or shear walls, we hide those, they're, they're very expensive. Uh, this cabin was pretty close to the epicenter of uh, the January quake and the guy that, that I did it for was down there at the time and he said, yeah, it did just fine. Said, of course it woke him up, but um, no damage. So I was, my, my ego was thankful for that. <laughs> Okay, this is an example in a moment phrase frame. We talked about the fuse. Right there is where we design the fuse. Like in plan, we put a little cut in the flanges of the beam to force that part to, to fail first. And that's exactly what it does. It, it crinkles, it crumples, kind of like the crumple zone in a car, you know, that absorbs the energy. And that's how they design them for crashes. Uh, same thing, it oscillates back and forth. The, it deforms and absorbs all the energy. Uh, we make sure that the column is about three times stronger because, again, you don't want columns to fall down. You can have a beam uh, get deformed and damaged, but as long as it doesn't collapse, you're fine, and people have time to get out of the, out of the building. So this is a perfect example of a moment frame connection. Uh, these are my favorite. I've done several of these around town. Um, just did the Kukpik building on 36th, the six-story thing with obnoxious LED lights on it. Any of you have seen that? No. That was a moment for you building. Uh, here's a typical shear wall, wood shear wall. It's what you have in your houses. Um, you know, plywood over the studs. We've got something here called a hold down. Uh, unless you live in a valley, they don't believe in hold downs out there. Uh, even though it's a code thing. Uh, <laughs> What code? <laughs> here's, here's an example of sometimes you see the vertical straps going on outside plywood when you're, when you're putting up hotels around town or something. That's just, you have to get a, a direct connection all the way down to the foundation. So, you know, as these things are taking load and trying to tip over, you strap them down to the level below you and then the bottom level is strapped to the foundation. This is what happens when you don't have enough shear wall on the lower lower level or maybe you double the width of your garage kind of thing uh, and then you get a shaker. Uh, this is actually an example of what we call a weak story where you've got a, a weaker lateral system before a you know below a higher one which is interesting because these windows create a horrible 
hole in the, the shear wall system. But they, they uh, glass shear walls, I think there's something to that. <laughs> but not so much for garage doors. I don't know. It's, that looks destroyed to me. Maybe not the first, maybe not the upper story though, right? There's the only example I could find of a cantilevered column. It's a telephone pole, all right. You know, it's cantilevered. It's it's rigidly fixed to the to the uh, uh, the ground. I guess my little gizmos are cantilevered columns too. When you think about it, uh, but you don't want the column to to go inelastic because uh, then whatever it's holding will come down. Um, other lateral systems. Those those are the primary ones that we see in like 99 percent of all buildings. Shear walls, brace frames, moment frames. Um, other ones that uh, you don't see very often, they're a little more expensive, they're good for retrofits. Uh, viscous dampers, uh, those are good for retrofits. They're like pistons in, or shock absorbers in your car. Uh, they, they absorb the energy as it moves. The only problem with them is they don't have like built-in springs to get the building to spring back, so the building goes plonk and kind of sits there, and unless you've got some other kind of system to push it back, you just got a diagonal, like a, uh, what's that, leaning tower or piece or kind of thing. So you usually uh, incorporate those with moment frames. Uh, and then base isolators. I like base isolators. We tried to get KTUU to uh, use them for a big antenna dish they had out there, but they just thought it was dumb. <laughs> they were probably right. But, uh, uh, so here's an example of a viscous damper. Uh, you got the little shock absorber, so when the seismic motion moves, it, it absorbs it. But again, there's nothing to push it back. And I don't know why the dampers don't come with built-in springs like, like shock absorbers in cars do. I wonder something. Uh, base isolation. I love base isolation because what you're doing is it's the ground that's moving, it's not the building. The building gets its force from its own inertia as, as its foundation moves. So if you uh, isolate the foundation from the, the moving ground, you get no force to the building. Um, I would have loved to have added some, some uh, videos of testing, like three-story wood structures on base isolation, like before and after base isolation. And, you get the big shake table moving, and, and then the, the, the structure's not even moving. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Um, so what these are is like big rubber snubbers or something that you sit all the columns or the footings on, and they, they're flexible enough to, to absorb the energy and, and move with them, but, but stiff enough to you know still hold up the building. Um, my firm is actually successfully installing these in a hospital in Japan. Uh, and it's been going very well. I like this. I, I like. I found this on the internet. But this is a good example of base isolation. You know, the screaming buildings rocking with the earthquake, and this guy's just sleeping through it. So he's on base isolators. So to conclude, I'm just going to read this. Uh, Seismic design is continuing to develop and the code is updated each cycle as we learn more about the behavior of ground motion and, and structures. This happens through testing, observations of actual events. Uh, we still can't predict earthquakes. We, you know, we, we use mice and dogs, I guess, to sense them, but we don't really know how to predict them yet. And then, just a fun thing, uh, James Amrine, he's kind of the father of masonry engineering. He developed this quote, which really rings true. Uh, he keeps us uh, humble, so our heads don't swell too much. But structural engineering is the art of molding materials we do not wholly understand into shapes we cannot precisely analyze, so as to understand forces we cannot really assess in such a way that the community at large has no reason to suspect the extent of our ignorance. Thank you.
Yeah, in a design level earthquake, it's damaged. It's it's no longer adequate. Uh, but what it did was it deformed enough to, to keep the building from collapsing. So like in a moment frame, the, the beam that you saw, the buckled beam, that would have to be replaced. Uh, it, it's you know brace embraced bays, the 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 um, the braces get these we call plastic hinges. Uh, those have to be replaced. That takes, you know, we're talking a, a 9.5 kind of event, or something definitely over a nine to cause something like that. Experiences, right? Like all my Star Wars books went flying, <laughs> but but you know my Pulitzer Prize one stayed in the in the. In the uh, it's telling me something. Uh, yeah, it really depends on on the motion. And in in my PowerPoint presentation, this is the the, the Adobe version, but in PowerPoint, I included that uh, accelerometer graph that the Daily News posted about how different parts of the the town shook at different, and it was because of the soil amplification. Uh, where I was, we, we got 0.15 Gs, which, which is a lot. Um, actually, you know, the 64 quake, um, you know, the low end of that was 0.15 Gs. So if this thing had lasted longer, we would have had some serious damage around town. Um, but yeah, some, some places just, you know, barely felt it. It was just a, a fun ride. They went right back to sleep. and. People like in my neighborhood, we were going out and checking our gas meters, etc. But uh, it was in, in at my house. All my pictures in the north-south walls were slanted, face down to the south. It was it's, it was kind of weird. Uh, so what I think was there was more shaking in one direction than the other. Like the the actual uh, uh, love waves were were more focused in one direction. <laughs> Yes. I had a question about uh, you know you explain the science behind it, but the fact that we had so little damage. Do you know much about the code and inspection and appearance of code? You kind of mentioned Godzilla, but I thought we don't have a really good code and appearance to it. It's so little damage from that point. Right. So she was asking why you know even though it's a seven point one, the same as you know, the Loma Prieta earthquake, why did we not have as much damage? We're a much newer uh, city. Um, most things that get damaged are, are poorly designed or improperly designed or, you know, pre-1970s stuff where they didn't take ductility into account. Uh, but, you know, and again, we don't use a lot of concrete here. Um, poorly reinforced concrete does, does fail uh, quite dramatically. Uh, but we use steel and wood, two of the most ductile materials that we have to design with. Uh, we do. We did get damage around town. I found. I was. I saw several, for instance, uh, stairwells that had uh, cracking in their CMU, the, the block masonry stuff. Uh, and again, you know, those are those were old buildings that were probably didn't have enough detailing in the reinforcement. Uh, I understand that uh, West High School had some damage. You know that that one we kind of went for a ride, uh, but yeah, um, for the for the most part, and especially for the newer buildings, they can they can take a, a lot larger uh, accelerations than, than we had. Yes, there's like three hands in this family. Uh, it's gonna be the little one. He's gonna stump me.
So, so the question was asked if uh, earthquakes all occur at like, the same elevation underground or different earthquakes, you know, if they all occur at that same elevation. No, it's uh, a, a subduction zone quake, for instance, is really deep, like the, the, the rupture will be 60 to 100 miles below us. Uh, but you get shallow faults, like it's called the Castle Mountain or Castle Ridge, Castle Mountain Fault, which is up near Willow. That's that one goes all the time. Like once a month, we get a, at least a four out of that, and every once in a while we get the fives. Those are shallow. Those are within you know 10, 15 miles of, of the surface. Uh, so yeah, it, they can be at any depth. Uh, in the black. Yeah, I was curious, uh, especially considering the uh, Cascadia. Uh, you know, I've read some articles about Seattle. Just as you mentioned, you're screwed. They're um, screwed. Yeah. And in the Bay Area, like I was in bed for this last one. In '89, I was in center field uh, mm. at Candlestick. <laughs> um, have the more major metropolitan areas have they improved to the level where you know we can expect? Uh, less damage than an entire city basically right down. actually the Loma Prieta earthquake uh, created a, a big uh, retrofit uh, movement throughout the United States on the, the, most of the damage occurred to, to under or non reinforced concrete uh, like the Bay Bridge collapse etc and and they found that some of the detailing that they were using was inadequate and the comp the, like for instance, the columns would just rupture outward um, from from some of the accelerations, and so now what we've learned from that is to add more. It's called confinement steel to keep it intact, uh, and then things that are um, don't have reinforcement, like a lot of stone masonry. Like think about Art Deco things on tops of buildings that can sway and just crack and fall, you know, several stories. So we have ways of uh, retrofitting those with. We call it FRP, uh, fiber reinforced plastic wrap, where we can coat it on top of concrete, and it's a very ductile material. Then you coat coat that with uh, a skim coat or something, so it looks like it's part of the concrete. But yeah, ever for the last 20 years, we've been uh, doing lots of retrofits. Yes. I used to work in a three-story with a basement office building. It was reinforced masonry. Um, with wood interior floors probably supported with some sort of steel support. Um, when that building were to fail, how would it fail? Would it, would it survive? Would it totally collapse? Would it fall over? What would a masonry building do? Uh, they usually <coughs> develop um, diagonal cracks between the courses. And what were the floors made out of? Uh, like wood okay, then that's where it would have failed. <laughs> uh, after Northridge earthquake, what we discovered was a lot of uh, buildings with, with concrete or masonry walls and wood floors. The wood floors would pull away from the, the rigid, uh, heavy concrete, right? Okay, because in an earthquake, the concrete is really feeling a lot more load because it, it's all related to mass. So the, the walls pull away from the, the wood diaphragm, and then the wood ledgers, um, they're not designed to take that kind of direction of load. They're, they were there you know, just to take vertical people load. And what would happen is they would split apart. It's something called cross-grain tension or cross-grain bending. Uh, you picture, picture wood as just a bunch of straws put together, okay? And when you're loading the straws, you know, along their length, they're very strong, but you, if you pull them apart, there's really no, no bond between them. So what happened is uh, these walls would pull away from the diaphragms, the, the floors, um, and then the, the floors would just collapse. Uh, the walls would, most, and then the walls no longer had any lateral support, and then they would collapse. So now, uh, since Northridge, uh, we have uh, requirements where we're not allowed to put any wood what's anywhere in cross grain bending. Yes? You talked about natural frequency of the building in Mexico City. 
Is that was that determined, or could you determine that before the earthquake, or was it only after the earthquake that you realized there was a natural frequency? I don't know. I, I don't know if the scientists down there realized that the ten-story buildings would would be in peril, and or you know if it was just one of those things where they discovered it after the fact. But it, it was pretty cataclysmic. Uh, I actually had an architect friend that lived there when it happened, and she said it was just very traumatic to see those those come down, and why God only picked on the ten-story buildings and not the other. Yes.
so if you have a, a, a an event that's that dramatic, you know, we go out and look at things like that in red tag. Uh, but you might have something like a, a shear wall that uh, got damaged, you know, pulled away from the foundation, and, and no one looked at it. And then the next one that comes, it, it there is potential, you know, unless you checked it, but. Usually for a house, it's pretty obvious if something's moved or changed. You'll see cracks in the sheetrock um, that weren't there a minute ago. Uh, and then, uh, but for the most part, uh, again, you know, wood, wood frame buildings do really well in earthquakes. Okay. Thank you. I do need a drink. And that was a great talk. I want to say if you're a, you're a natural, you may need to do this again. And great questions, uh, too. And now our trivia quiz, because some of you may be wondering the answers that weren't answered.